I want to talk a little bit about the, uh, the impact of, of neuroscience research uh, on juvenile justice policy and on the interest in this research in the last, uh, the last decade or so. And, and I am a really old-fashioned law professor and I don't have a single picture of the brain or of anything <laughs> else, so that's, so that's just the way, the way it is. But this, what we're seeing in this, uh, in this uh, trend and this fascination with neuroscience is part of a larger trend uh, uh, in juvenile justice that to some extent is a rejection of, or at least a backing off from, the policies of the 1990s in which uh, juvenile offenders were labeled as super predators and uh, states across the country uh, passed laws uh, facilitating adult punishment, uh, prosecution and punishment of, uh, of uh, juveniles. Well, uh, that, that period seems to, uh, to have, or that those attitudes and that kind of distress over juvenile con crime has, has waned uh, to some extent. And what you might describe the, the current period as almost in some ways a kind of reemergence of, uh, of the, the traditional view that juvenile offenders are in some ways fundamentally different from their adult counterparts in ways that ought to, uh, ought to affect the way the justice system treats them. But the difference between traditional policy and, uh, and today is that today the the discourse and the uh, and the policy debate is influenced by uh, by uh, developmental science, developmental psychology, and and a growing body of neuroscience research, which uh, which um, B J has described, and some of which is uh, is being done by the uh, by the MacArthur uh, network. Uh, and and this this research is is viewed as being very relevant to juvenile justice policy. And I think going back to the issue that uh, that Jeff raised about about psychopaths, and that that I think is 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 a question that often comes up on uh, on these issues is what does neuroscience really have to add to a body of developmental psychology research that already tells us that adolescents uh, engage in risk-taking behavior, that they're highly subject to peer influence, that they don't look ahead in making decisions, that they're, they're much more emotional. Uh, and I think, I think the answer is that, that that research is clearly very important in itself, but I think that the, by tying the behavioral research to the sort of underlying brain function and, uh, and structure, that there's a, a sort of more compelling account uh, of why it is that adolescents act the way they do. So this, this story that, that, um, uh, that BJ described, that we're, we're learning from the research of this imbalance in sort of the way the adolescent brain develops with the, the sort of early development around puberty of emotional centers and activation of those centers, but much slower development of the prefrontal cortex and the connections to the uh, emotion centers uh, that are necessary for, for self-control. That that's that explains to some extent why it is that adolescents do uh, uh, do what they do, and as as one uh, one scholar described it, it's it's sort of like starting the motor of a car without a good set of functioning brakes. Uh, that's that's what adolescence uh, adolescence is, and so I think it's not surprising that this this research has uh, has really captured the imagination. Of, uh, of the media, certainly, and the public, but also of lawmakers, of, of courts and, uh, and legislatures. And, and BJ mentioned the, uh, the three Supreme Court cases, the Eighth Amendment cases, that are, are probably the most famous examples of lawmakers using developmental science 
uh, in support of a legal uh, conclusion uh, that in this case that adolescents because of their developmental immaturity are less culpable than their uh, adult counterparts and that therefore <coughs> the harsh sentences that might be appropriate for adults uh, are not appropriate for, for adolescents. So in Roper, the abolition of the juvenile death penalty, uh, in, in Graham in 2012, the prohibition of life without parole for juveniles for non-homicide offenses, and in Miller, the prohibition of life without parole on a mandatory basis for, uh, uh, for juvenile offenders, even uh, even for uh, for homicide. Now, in in uh, in Roper, the court uh, the court uh, mentions uh, developmental science, but it doesn't talk about neuroscience. Even though some of the amicus briefs uh, uh, made arguments on the basis of neuroscience research, and it was discussed to some extent in the oral arguments, but the court, in its opinion, did not uh, did not talk about. Uh, the neuroscience, but in, in Graham and Miller, the neuro adolescent brain science was really front and center in those, uh, in those uh, two uh, opinions. And the court found life without uh, parole to be an excessive punishment for juveniles under the, uh, under the, under the Eighth uh, uh, Amendment. Uh, because they are less culpable, at least in, in most cases, an, uh, an excessive uh, punishment. And it emphasized that its conclusion wasn't based on what every parent knows, which is one of the reactions, but on science uh, and uh, social science. So, so this, you know, this is really the straight story that seems seem to be saying. And it went on to say in Graham and repeated uh, in Miller uh, that developments in psychology and brain science show fundamental differences between juveniles and adult minds. Parts of the brain involved in behavioral control continue to, uh, to mature through late, uh, late adolescence. The court also observed uh, that juveniles are more capable of change uh, than are adults, and their actions are less likely uh, to be evidence of irretrievably depraved uh, character. And so, based on the scientific evidence, or at least supported by the scientific evidence, uh, the court uh, found that juveniles are less culpable than adults, and as it said, as the years go by and neurological development occurs, uh, the deficiencies uh, uh, will be uh, will be reformed, uh, and so this the, you know these are landmark cases cases in terms of the the importance of uh, of this uh, adolescent uh, brain research uh, to uh, uh, to uh, courts, and what's happened since uh, since Graham and Miller. Uh, has been, and, and some of you were probably uh, uh, aware of this, perhaps in your own courts, that there has been a flood of litigation in uh, in state and, and federal in state and federal courts. So that, for example, after Graham, uh, the uh, uh, long sentences for juveniles have been challenged uh, on the ground that they are effectively life without parole. Uh, and so there, there's a statement in Graham by, uh, by the court uh, that there has to be some meaningful opportunity to obtain, uh, to obtain release based on demonstrated maturity. Uh, and uh, and uh, attorneys for, uh, for uh, uh, defendants and prisoners have taken the statement to challenge very long term of year sentences that were not life without parole. So that in California, the California Supreme Court overturned a 110 year sentence on the ground that it was uh, a violation uh, of, of Graham and did not give a meaningful opportunity for, uh, for, the, uh, for the juvenile to, uh, uh, to, uh, to rehabilitate. There are currently two 
cases before the Florida Supreme Court, and Florida is, is sort of famous for its tough sentencing of juveniles. Most of the life without parole cases that were, uh, that were reversed in Graham came from Florida, and the Florida Supreme Court is currently considering two cases in which youths received 70 and 90 90 year uh, sentences and their attorneys are arguing that this provides no opportunity for reform. Since Miller there has been again a flood of state and federal habeas proceedings ad uh, addressing the issue of whether Miller is meant to be retroactive and to apply to offenders in prison who were sentenced uh, long before uh, uh, Miller was decided. It, it, there seemed to be agreement that Graham is retroactive, that Graham was a substantive rule of constitutional law excluding a, ca a category of offenders from a particular sentence. So that hasn't been so controversial. But with Miller, which, which didn't prohibit life without parole, but simply prohibited the mandatory sentence, there has been a lot of uh, different views among state and federal courts as to whether it's a procedural rule and hence not retroactive or a, uh, a substantive rule of constitutional law and is retroactive and one court has even found uh, Miller to establish uh, the rare bird of a watershed rule of uh, criminal procedure and, and made it retroactive on, uh, uh, on that basis. This this issue will continue to uh, to play uh, to play out, but there is an, there's another issue that is starting to uh, to uh, come up in in state and federal courts, uh, which which is whether the the post Miller response to sentencing juveniles uh, is uh, conforms to the Miller requirements. So, for example, recently, as, as, as I'm sure you know, Judge Roof, Pennsylvania passed, uh, passed a law establishing a, a minimum 35-year sentence for 14-year-old uh, 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 defendants convicted of murder and uh, 30, 35 years for a uh, minimum sentence for 15 to 17-year-olds. And so, so that statute is being challenged on, uh, on the ground that, uh, that it doesn't allow uh, for what Miller emphasizes pretty, pretty strongly that there needs to be an opportunity for the court to consider the immaturity of the juvenile offender. And that was the objection to the mandatory sentence of life without parole, that it didn't allow such an opportunity. And, and so uh, advocates are arguing uh, in this new set of cases that, that the sentencing regimes that states have, have devised in response to Miller may not do that, uh, may not do that either. Now, one state has, has embraced uh, the, uh, the spirit of Miller, if, uh, if you want to call it that, in uh, California has revised its uh, juvenile sentencing uh, statute uh, uh, in response to Graham and Miller, first to provide that, that all prisoners serving life without parole uh, for sentences that they got as, as, uh, uh, as juveniles are entitled to, uh, to petition for resentencing. And so without, without being challenged, in court in a habeas proceeding, California legislatively has, has treated Miller as being uh, retroactive. But it also, more recently, has, has enacted uh, a statute that creates something that, that they're calling um, youth parole hearings. Uh, and under this statute, which has a long introductory sentence talking about Miller and Graham and the adolescent brain uh, and, then, and then goes on to provide that parole boards uh, are required to consider releasing uh, juvenile, juvenile criminals who are given long, uh, long sentences on an expedited basis. And in these special parole hearings, they are, they are to give great weight to the diminished culpability of juvenile offenders and uh, almost seeming to say 
almost a resentencing of whether, you know, asking whether the initial sentence was, was fair, uh, and also to consider how much uh, the prisoner uh, has matured over time. So picking up uh, on, the, on the prescription from, uh, from Graham. Uh, and then other states have, uh, have uh, embraced the, uh, brain science and taken the, uh, the message of Graham and, uh, and Miller to, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to be uh, important in devising their uh, juvenile justice uh, laws. And, uh, and so there's, the, there's been quite a lot of resistance, and certainly in Pennsylvania, you. Uh, we've seen that, but but there has also been uh, in uh, in legislative debate and sometimes in <coughs> statutes a, a sort of pointing to adolescent brain science and the immature adolescent brain as uh, as the the reason in the state of Washington, uh, for example, uh, that a statute requiring a mandatory minimum sentence uh, should be uh, should be uh, repealed. So I, I want to close, and this this came up in in, uh, in Jeff's uh, talk earlier. But I I, I want to close well, with a kind of uh, cautionary note about the enthusiasm for for bringing this this knowledge about adolescent brain development into to uh, into uh, juvenile justice policy, and particularly into. Uh, judicial uh, proceedings. The the emphasis that uh, in Miller and in the and in the post Miller uh, sentencing discussion on the immaturity of young offenders and how and the difference between young offenders uh, and and adults is almost suggesting an expanded role for evidence about. Adolescent immaturity and and uh, and uh, the immaturity of adolescent brains, and this could be both good and bad. It could be good, perhaps, to the extent that courts are are informed about general knowledge about about adolescent brain development that, as as BJ has suggested, uh, is is beginning to indicate pretty strongly that adolescent decision making. Uh, really is uh, about criminal offending. It re really is different from adults, and and it would be good for courts to have that that uh, general knowledge in uh, in sentencing uh, uh, young offenders. And uh, but but it seems very likely, and in fact, it has already happened that this focus on the importance of youthful immaturity is uh, is an invitation to attorneys to bring in brain uh, research evidence to, to demonstrate that a particular juvenile either does or does not have an immature brain. And so, so the, the uh, applying the general knowledge to, uh, to uh, the, uh, the individual offenders, it's almost inevitable that, that this will happen, and it has already begun to happen, but the scientists, as, as BJ has suggested, would tell you that it is very premature uh, uh, to, to think that we have anything to say at, at this point about whether, uh, whether an individual uh, has a, uh, a mature uh, or an immature brain. It might be that at some point, uh, you know, behavioral and, and uh, neuroscience data will provide age norms against which a particular a particular youth could be measured, but we're really not at that point uh, yet. And courts to date have rejected this evidence, uh, to my knowledge, and that's a good thing. So.